Hello, welcome to Doors to Hope and Healing, an inside look at foster care and adoption needs in Connecticut. My name is Jacqueline Ford. I am humbled and honored to have worked for the Department of Children and Families for over 25 years, and although I may be familiar with many of the topics I bring to you, I am inviting experts in those fields to share their knowledge. It is my hope that each week I can help to dispel those myths and misconceptions that often act as barriers to finding homes for Connecticut children. For the past eight years, our guest today has been leading an army of dedicated agency staff with a respectful, compassionate, hands-on approach to getting the work done. Her focus, her courage, and commitment has improved the lives of the most vulnerable population in our state, the children and families we serve. She has been a fearless and humble leader, and it is my absolute honor and privilege to welcome our commissioner, Joette Katz, to our show today. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's, it's bittersweet to have you here because we're going to talk about all of the, the accomplishments and the work that's been done over the last several years, but it's also at a time where we're going to be changing our focus and our journey and, um, and losing you. And it's been an honor to have you, you. Uh, for all these years. Um, so let's get started. What, is your biggest, what was your biggest worry coming into this huge role as the commissioner? of DCF? Well, I was an outsider. And I wasn't sure that I was going to be accepted because I didn't grow up in the agency. I didn't have a social work background. I was a judge. I was on the Connecticut Supreme Court for 18 plus years. And so I was an outsider. And I had to figure out uh, pretty quickly whom to identify in the agency that I could turn to, uh, learn from. I did a lot of inside, outside uh, work. Even before, uh, even before I assumed the position, I met with a lot of, um, I met with monitors, I met with advocates, and then of course we had a number of forms after I took the position. My concern, uh, and I think my biggest worry was, how, how people would respond to me. I think in any agency, you generally have about 30% of the people who are going to be with you in the direction you want to go, 30% you're never going to get, uh, and the 40% in the middle. And so my goal was to figure out how to, how to um, achieve a comfort level with staff, how to get staff, uh, I think, to, um, to feel both safe with me, mm -hmm. and also how I could empower them. Because I think people really wanted to do really good social work. And I don't mean to suggest for a moment that there were a lot of wonderful things happening. But people were afraid. There was a culture of fear at the department. Uh, historically, and, and we've read about it around the nation, foster care panic. Something bad happens, and the next day, 500 children get removed. Mm -hmm. Past administrations, I think, were put under enormous scrutiny. So for me, in, in a nutshell, I had to figure out how to, how to get that 40%. And it, it took some time, but um, you know, I went around the uh, because we, we all draw on our experience, and I was a judge for over 20 years. And, and stop me if I'm spending too nope, much time nope, on this nope. question, Not but at all. but so I went around to all of the offices and I talked to people about my own experience and what it was like on the Supreme Court, and when I was reviewing decisions by trial judges, and I would say to them, if a trial judge, um, if I'm looking at whether or not a trial judge abused his or her discretion, if the trial judge took evidence, took testimony, made findings of fact, read the law read the practice book and came up with a, per a particular decision, let's say, on whether it would, to let a piece of evidence in or to, to exclude it. Whether or not I would have made the same decision was not going to be um, the measure. It was If they did all those things, then they didn't abuse their discretion. Mm -hmm. And I talked to staff that I would view them the same way. So I understand how hard this work is. It is harder than anyone could imagine. And I say to people all the time, you could be a social worker at DCF for a day. Then let's see if you come back the next day. And so if, if they do all of those things and they work with their families and they accept some of the principles that were, the, the movement mm -hmm. that the department, uh, the direction the department was going in, and they made a call, they weren't going to be punished for it if, if something, because you recognize you're dealing with society's most vulnerable, mm -hmm. some of the most complex uh, problems that have existed through the ages, and, and to think that everything's going to be perfect, you set yourself up for disaster. So in a nutshell, I think that was, uh, that was my biggest concern of how I was going to be able to engage with staff. Sure, sure, and set that culture. And I know exactly. that for me personally, you had that uh, ability to really connect us to you Thank and you. to be humble and just 
like one of us in many ways, although we respected your leadership, um, you did set a comfortable um, you. platform for all of us. So you're in the 40%. Yeah, I'm you, in the were, you were probably in the first 30%. <laughs> I already was there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you came into the department, was there something that surprised you the most about our department? The um, the enormity, uh, not just of what of what you do and what we're responsible for. You know, the the Department of Children and Families to me is an agency. It's a child welfare agency, but everyone looks at it as it's a child welfare system. And so that was one of um, that was I think one of the the struggles to realize. You know. We're just one player. We have schools. We have the medical profession. We have society. There's so many. It's you know, it takes a village. Mm -hmm. But yet, at the end of the day, it's always DCF. It's it is. always mm -hmm. DCF. And so that um, that surprised me uh, in terms of the expectations that people had. Uh, the other thing that surprised me is how complicated everything is, and it just is. Um, you know, again, being uh, I was administrative judge of the appellate system at the Supreme Court, and as, as someone once said to me, Judge, you ask, you say jump, we say how high. Well, it's very different. Uh, everything we do, and you know this, you have to go through mm -hmm. DAS, OPM, mm -hmm. the legislature, and it's not that anyone is ill-intentioned. It's just everything takes so mm -hmm. long. And I remember reading; it was really funny, actually. So we're, you know, we're trying to do our entire IT system, 120 million dollars. The federal government's going to subsidize it. You don't do it like that. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember um, I read a, an, an op-ed um, or an editorial, I should say, in one of the local newspapers saying. It's it's time for me to go because I hadn't launched our IT system yet. <laughs> and I just thought, I thought, you know, there are probably no a 20 reasons that you could say get out, but I don't know that that would really be on the <laughs> list. So again, the the enormity and having and and both um, figuring out how to maneuver that mm -hmm. uh, and to try and also educate the public about about what that really means. Mm -hmm. um, whom did you contact, rely on, and engage with? Uh, nationally to achieve your goals oh, well. and how useful were they? Sure, uh, very. Uh, I mean, everybody knows, uh, or at least people in, in our line of work know uh, the Annie Casey Foundation, mm -hmm. Jim Casey, Casey Family Programs, uh, and and I, uh, uh, Richard Wexler. I mean, there are national experts, uh, other commissioners, and everybody was incredibly helpful because uh, I had to educate myself. Mm -hmm. And that was the one thing, that was the, well, I thought I brought um, a couple of strengths. One was, um, frankly, the ability to gather a lot of information and s synthesize it, because that's what I had to do for you know, however many, 20 plus years, um, synthesize it and then figure out uh, how to how to then implement um, and the implementation part is always the I think in any big agency mm -hmm. is the harder part but but the ability to synthesize material figure out best practices you know uh, again I, I always refer back to this because we we do what we know when I had to make decisions as a judge uh, you can't shoot from the hip it doesn't work and it and it's never the right decision uh, you have to trust your instincts but it's really gathering information and learning and then making a decision and um, I get in trouble all the time because I quote Shakespeare I quote Voltaire and Voltaire says don't let perfection be the enemy of the good and so mm -hmm. for me it was gathering all of this information and figuring out the direction I wanted to go with the department getting technical assistance getting support learning from people but at the end of the day um, you know you, you then and this is the second strength I thought it I think I brought to the department is the ability to make a decision mm -hmm. and uh, and sometimes people call that and, and when I make when I've made that decision um, you know things things happen but if you do all your homework ahead of time and you set a certain tone and a certain direction it doesn't mean that when something when a mistake happens that you abandon it. Mm -hmm. You may, what I call, tweak it. You know, you may refine it. You have to revisit certain things. You can reassess, but you don't abandon it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, all of these partners uh, both educated me, supported me, and confirmed my, my judgment and instincts. And that was very, very valuable, particularly for an outsider. I'm sure it was. And, and like you talked about the staff and talking with them, and as long as we've made decisions with educating ourselves, and it's the same thing with you because you've had to make some pretty big decisions and not always easy decisions um, for others to receive. No, no, that, that's right. Uh, and you're not, you know, it, it's, 
it's funny. I, I was talking to somebody about uh, other commissioners, and this happens nationally. Not, not. I don't want to limit it to Connecticut, but you know, you try and please people. Mm -hmm. So this advocate wants this, and this legislator wants that, and this provider wants this. And if you, if that's all you're trying to do. First of all, you end up generally not pleasing them because there's something else that's going to be behind it, but also you don't make the right decision. Mm -hmm. So, um, so to me, you know, everything is driven by what is in the best interest of the children and families we serve. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and sometimes I make decisions, uh, probably not infrequently, that are not always popular. Mm -hmm. And I get that. And that's, uh, and believe me, those decisions weigh heavily on me. I say to people all the time. You know, but at the end of the day, when I make those calls, I can look at myself in the mirror. I may not sleep at nights, mm -hmm. but I can look at myself in the mirror. Did you realize that you would have to make such heavy decisions coming in? In truth, uh, no, mm -hmm. no. Uh, I mean, I made some very heavy decisions as a judge, uh, but but these, the decisions and calls that I've had to make are so so much more hands-on, mm -hmm. so much more personal, and you see the consequences. Uh, they're immediate mm -hmm. and they're very visible. As a judge, you make decisions and you decide a particular case and you set the law for a particular area, but you don't really see, I mean, it takes years as cases get tried and, and then appealed, you, you see, but again, it's sort of almost in a black and white, it's a transcript right. and it's very distant. The decisions I've had to make as a commissioner and the cases I've gotten involved in, the direction that I've worked with others to, to um, uh, around the department and where I think we should be going has much more direct, immediate impact and, uh, and consequently uh, sometimes weigh heavily on me. And every decision in every family's situation is entirely different. So That's all of those right. decisions, so it's not that black and white Never. rule following. You don't open up a book and just right. refer to that page. That's, that's exactly right. Um, That's you know, exactly I've right. had the um, opportunity to be at some conferences and with people from across the country and mm -hmm. the way that their child welfare systems are working, and especially because of the role I play at DCF with foster care and adoption, what people are doing. And it's always a proud moment to be sitting in those rooms because we have um, far exceeded uh, what the other states are doing you know, for their families and their children and the sibling groups and all of that. Can you talk a little bit about kinship care? Oh, thank you. It's <laughs> my passion. Uh, you know, when, when I came to the department, we had the, the lowest or one of the lowest, if not the lowest, uh, percentage of children living with relatives. And, you know, when you talk about uh, because one of our mandates is obviously mental and behavioral health, and I'm thinking, well, okay, not only are we supposed to be working to children to uh, to treat issues and to um, and to recognize and and get them on a better path, but we're not supposed to be creating the problem. Mm -hmm. And 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 again, I do not want to denigrate our core foster families, whom I adore and and value. But but every time you remove a child. It's a traumatic event. So when, when I talk about creating the mental health issue, creating the, um, the trauma, we were part of the problem mm -hmm. and not always part of the solution. So uh, our ability to move to a system that, uh, and actually you know because I, I started out sending memos, that, uh, that frankly uh, kin or fictive kin, and fictive mm -hmm. kin being, and I know you know this, but for your, uh, your listeners, fictive kin uh, describes or, or used to be special placements, uh, people who know the child. It, I mean, I tell, I you told workers all the time, look, I had 20 aunts and uncles and none of them were biologically related to mm -hmm. me. But they were people that I knew, whom I knew I could turn to and, uh, and who, on whom I could rely. So what do we do to shift the system to have more of our children, when they have to be removed, go to someone whom they know to minimize the trauma? Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say we have between relative care and kin care, uh, we have 44% of our children so now we are, if not the highest in the nation, one of the highest. And, but that took, that took a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, that took a lot of, uh, because again, when you're dealing with 3,400 employees, it's all about messaging and then reinforcing. And so I, I said, okay, relative care is gonna be the presumptive placement, so forth and so on. But that's not at all cost. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you don't evaluate that particular person, that adult, and, and what, what that relationship is, and how that adult can support that child and facilitate um, uh, a return home if that's mm -hmm. appropriate, all of those things. But also recognizing that many of our relatives have some of the same challenges that our 
bio families have. Sure. So that meant not just picking them because they're relative and saying, okay, now, now we're done, okay, good. But what supports do they need to secure that placement? And of course, the, the, the other thing about relative care that's so, you, that's so helpful is children tend to bounce less. Mm -hmm. uh, we know they tend to be on psychotropic drugs less, and, and then obviously the, the mm -hmm. whole trauma piece of it. We had to do a lot of work. Um, I had to ensure safety, that workers would feel safe making these decisions. Mm -hmm. I also found out that there's, uh, that one of the reasons we were so low is because we have these, these bars. You know, if you had previous involvement in the child welfare system, or if you had a criminal record, you were disqualified. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, you know, quite frankly, for several reasons, again, recognizing that some of our families had some of the same challenges as our bio families, well, what involvement did they have with DCF? And how old was it? And how have they changed? And, and so I thought, you know what? Um, that's a huge burden to put on workers. I mean, they're going to have to do the lift. They're going to have to, if, if they want to place the child with this a particular family member, they're going to have to demonstrate why it's a good placement. And they're going to have to give me all of the facts. But ultimately, I, at the end of the day, w would be the one making the decision whether I supported that placement. Mm -hmm. And that meant I had to often look at the criminal history as well as the, if there was any child protective services history. And of course what I realized is, is so people, number of things, people change. Uh, I'm a big believer in that and in redemption. Uh, also, I found out that a lot of people were involved in child welfare years ago. They would not, they certainly under my administration would not be involved in child welfare. Right. I mean, we just... Everybody touched child welfare. Uh, sure. And then, of course, I saw the huge racial disparity in which families touched child welfare. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, so it's almost, like a, it's almost uh, like a status offense. You never lose that. So if you had this history, well, you, it carries you forever. But mm -hmm. it, should, should the inability to raise your grandchild be the consequence of a behavior you exhibited 25 years ago? Right, right, how unfair that could be. Exactly, and, and most importantly, uh, how detrimental it is for that child. So, so that's probably the thing I am the proudest of. And it, mm -hmm. and it it begins early on. Um, again, you know all this, but for your listeners, you know, they considered removal practice. Mm -hmm. So so when, when a child, when there's a, a hist an issue and the case comes to our attention and there's going to be a presumptive removal because of, of a risk and safety factor, convening the family immediately. Um, and the great thing is it's actually their lawyers who are, have been the most supportive of this. And the family comes together and we say, bring everybody. Bring your, your priest, bring your doctor, bring anybody you want to, to help us figure out how to ensure this child's safety. And in 80% of the cases where you've been able to do that prior to removal, which is phenomenal. Obviously, there are going to be a certain percentage of cases where, no, 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 it's, it's got to be immediate and mm -hmm. it's because there's a significant risk and safety factor. And of the cases where we held these meetings before removal, 50% of those children did not get removed, which is phenomenal. It is. And of the 50% of the kids who did get removed, 50% of them went to family or kin. So now you see this number has just gone like mm -hmm. this. And again, doesn't mean we walk away from the table. There's a lot of work that goes into supporting that placement, mm -hmm. as, as you know uh, better than I. But, but it ends up being in the best interest of, of a child. And, uh, and, but with this comes risks, with mm -hmm. everything we do. You know, our differential response system, as opposed to looking at, at every case as an investigatory, uh, through an investigatory lens, everything has risks associated mm -hmm. with it. And so getting back to your first question, because it all sort of circles back, is what's an educated risk? What's a calculated mm -hmm. risk, as opposed to what is um, a whimsical, uh, irresponsible risk, and there's a big difference. Well, I think with our goal being um, keeping children with their families whenever possible, I think it's so important for our viewers to hear what you said about all the attempts that we make to keep a child with their family. And if they can't be with their family, um, their biological parent, then with a family member or someone in their community that they feel connected to. Um, do you have any you. regrets? Uh, I wanted to do more. When I came in, we had a budget of $895 million, and I said, I don't need any more money. I can even do it with less. We're now down to about $760 million, and I know that sounds like an enormous number, to your, to, again, to your listeners, but not when you're serving 36,000 children and doing all the work that we do. So my regret is um, I wanted everything we do, I wanted more. Mm -hmm. um, 
I wanted to get out of 1F, the federal consent decree. We've gone, we've renegotiated, we've done enormous progress, we've captured it. Uh, federal court has said some lovely things about the department and, um, and the work that we've done. We went from 22 measures, we are now down to five, and of those, uh, the five, two of them have multiple domains, half of those are gone. And um, so I'm very proud of that. I would have liked to have seen it through, unfortunately, mm -hmm. really because of budget constraints. And, and again, that gets back to your second question about some of the frustrations. So if there's a hiring freeze, you know, we're like anybody else, mm -hmm. um, although we think we're special, and, and uh, I certainly think we're special, and I've convinced the governor and OPM Secretary Barnes that we're special. But sometimes uh, things don't happen as quickly as I would like. And so we then end up in a situation where we're not able to hire, we're not able to hire, and then suddenly we are able to hire, the floodgates open, it's great, we do all this hiring. Well, where do we get our, our many of our best workers? We steal them from our providers. Mm -hmm. And then, then our families can't right. get served because right. we've stolen their one bilingual social right. worker. Right, right. So, so um, basically balancing all of mm -hmm. that can sometimes be very frustrating. Um, other regrets? Uh, you know, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not, I don't have a good reputation for being warm and fuzzy. <laughs> Let's just say that. But I think, and so people think of me as, as stubborn. And, and it's funny, my, my daughter said to me the other day, and who knows me quite well, she's 33 years of age, and she said, I, I wouldn't call you stubborn. She said, I'd like to call you stubborn, but she said it wouldn't <laughs> be fair. She said, I call you decisive. Mm -hmm. And. I haven't been able to communicate that distinction to other people. Uh, sure, when I think I'm right at the end of the day, well, mm -hmm. yes, then of course I'm going to follow a certain path. Right. Uh, and, and I call that being decisive, as a, and I don't call it being stubborn. Stubborn is someone who just comes up with a decision, isn't interested in what mm -hmm. anybody else has to say. I'm going this way, that's it. I, I like to think of myself differently. I take, I take it all in, I listen to everybody, I do my homework, and then I make a decision after, after all of that. Uh, I don't think, frankly, and, and uh, you've seen my memo about the next commissioner having a honeymoon, mm -hmm. I think if I have a regret, I, was not, uh, I wasn't able to, to uh, always work uh, as well uh, with some decision makers, and and I was perceived as being stubborn, I think, and rigid, and 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 I'm I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, whether it's fair or unfair is, is is really secondary. I'm sorry about that because if anyone can point to something that that may have not been accomplished mm -hmm. uh, because of that perception, well, and that would be a regret. Well, we have less than a minute left. Do you have just a few words for your successor? If you can give them just a few words of advice. Uh, meet with our adolescent kids, our YAB, as often as you possibly can, our youth from the YAB. They, are, they have been my greatest source of strength. Mm -hmm. Seriously, they have been my greatest comfort. Uh, they are what it's about. And uh, and they they are to be cherished and valued. You've you've mm -hmm. seen the the video, but more than that, they are our best educators. Who better to tell us what we're doing right and doing wrong than the children who have come through our system? I so agree. that would be my advice. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm oh, thank you. So privileged to be able to give you a platform to talk about your your legacy with us, and um, you will be greatly missed. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much, and and thank thank your listeners for taking the time to learn about all the great work that our department does. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the Department of Children and Families, I'll end our segment today with a simple yet deeply meaningful and genuinely intended thank you to our Commissioner Joette Katz, a leader whose precious time and powerful impact has made an incredible difference for the children and families in the state of Connecticut. Now I would like to end with um, a video of Alaya, a young lady who is longing to belong to a family of her own. I like to go swimming. I like to play with dogs. I like to play at my little pet shops. I like to listen to music. When I grow up, I would really love to be an animal scientist because I love animals so much. And I really want to learn more about their behaviors and why they do certain things. My perfect day would probably 
be getting up at like 12 p.m. and going to the beach and playing in the sand and going swimming and then going to watch a movie later. I love to go to amusement parks and I like to go on the rides. I really like roller coasters. I think that they're really fun. I really like YouTube and I'm planning on being a Littlest Pet Shop YouTuber. A few reasons why I want to start a YouTube channel is because I want to be able to inspire people who are going through tough times. And also that bullying really isn't a good thing because it brings people through stuff that they shouldn't have to go through. One of the biggest things I learned is that even when you're going through tough times, you can't let that affect you. And you have to just be happy with yourself and you have to be who you are. The perfect family for me would be either a mom and a mom or a mom and a dad. I want a family that will accept me and love me for who I am and just to help me throughout life.